Let's not spend too much time establishing things. Football. The ball goes forward towards the net. You can buy it as FIFA, Pez, and don't get tricked by this one. It's actually a cleverly disguised XL. Skyrim. Get a quest to go to a cave and engage in the worst combat of your life for the next five minutes to bring the Springle Dungan to your quest giver. That's the next 50 hours of your life, and you can buy it as Skyrim or most video games. What do these two sets of games have in common? Not a lot. Considering games about sport sell about the same as, if not more, than games about fantasy, the word in this case meaning fiction and unreality as opposed to wizards and incest, it can be odd to acknowledge the isolation between these two sectors of games that has them appeal to extremely different people. Your typical male living space has a PlayStation with two different copies of whatever sports game is culturally relevant, plus Forza. But the living space of your average Reddit admin has three copies of games he's only ever described as you're playing it wrong. Fundamentally, these two branches of games end up being so different from one another that the rift is only natural. When one set of games is built on things that don't exist, with the common methodology to complete tasks being killing, and the other is a digitization of something bound by human limitation and the moral standing that handballs don't warrant a beheading, there's very little opportunity for either side to influence one another. However, every once in a while, these two concepts collide and in the brewery of game development emerges one of the most underappreciated subgenres, the sports fantasy. You played football with Mario? That's one of them. With a car? That's another. On the street? Well, it's not intrinsically a fantasy, but there's more nuance going on here. While I'd isolate sports games as titles attempting to estimate real-world sport through the medium of games, the sports fantasy is a lot more loose on what it can be. On the more conservative side, you've got games like FIFA and NBA Street that are both similar to their direct sports counterparts with very gamey additions. And on the other, you've got games like Roller Champions, completely disconnected from any real-world sport that uses games as a vehicle to create something that could only be described as sport. If we use these two to plot points between how willing they are to stray from reality, you can plop every game somewhere along this spectrum, but in every single one of them, I found little gems of ideas about games. While I understand why these games often get ignored by the core gaming audience, I think we should at least take the opportunity to explore these games a little, because for me at the very least, they've taken concepts that bore me to tears and turned them into some of my favourite games that Quite frankly, nobody that I respect seems to care about. Like, football's boring, right? Probably a contentious statement if I was to head down to the local spoons, but for me, I really don't like watching it. By proxy, I really like games that are it. That's not because football is intrinsically boring as a video game, but when the game's goal is to emulate it, it doesn't really make leverage of what video games as a medium can do. Every year FIFA releases, they put roadblocks in their systems and rules, not because that would be best for the video game that you're playing, but because that's how the game that already exists is. Got 11 players you can barely organize, and players get boo-boos because EA isn't making a game. They're making football. If you're the kind of person who willingly calls themselves a gamer, first of all, have some shame. And secondly, these steps to make the game authentic come across as arbitrary. When I've been believing I can block this four-way mix-up for the last four years, I'm struggling to buy into the big offside rule in the sky. So get rid of it. And while we're at it, get rid of injuries. Most of the players, add some walls, and boom. We just hit every single English person with a nostalgia wave. FIFA Street is one of the most underappreciated games of the mid-2000s. Not because it wasn't successful or remembered fondly, but because it's not discussed by the core gaming audience. Using FIFA as a base, Streets, not that one, turns towards four aside matches and blocked out cages to use the sport as a method to create an interesting game. Instead of solely having to rely on the positioning of your teammates to work your way up the pitch, here you have a trick system that lets you maneuver the ball around your opponent and into spaces that lets you take on entire teams as a one-man army. It lets this game be direct. If you want to challenge the guy in front of you, you can. And you can still be indirect. In fact, you can be as indirect as you like. Rebound the ball off of the arena to make for opportunities that wouldn't normally exist, letting you connect the team in ways that aren't as direct as the computer calculating where the ball has to travel to go to the next player. All of this comes together with a combo meter that encourages use of all of these systems, building towards a super that turns your next shot into a lightning bolt that's only blocked by miracle. These systems chain together to guide the player in a way that's much more familiar to conventional games, giving players who don't care about football 
football, me, a path to engaging with more of the fun even in the face of a concept that they don't care for. Tricks are a method of building meter and overcoming opponents, so players are passively drawn to hacking up someone's shins, which is in itself its own little drip reward. As you're doing this, you're working your way up the pitch almost passively, which generates opportunity to actually score while also building meter. Every time you take on a player or take a shot, you're building up this literal resource in the combo meter, but in your mind, what you're interpreting as fun is the tension of expectation. Unlike in normal FIFA, where that release can feel random and unclear if you don't understand the sport, FIFA Street has a big button that's screaming at you to get up to their net so you can get your sweet, sweet dopamine. All this new stuff creates attention and release along with little rewards along the way that's more familiar to traditional games, peeling away the requirement to care about the footy to enjoy the footy. In that way, FIFA Street is like a lot of the sports fantasy of the time. The highlight was what was new, the stuff that exists in this game that doesn't exist in real life, and the additions to the pre-existing concept. In Mario Strikers, that's the items and the clearly goofy stuff going on, but a game like Klonoa Beach Volleyball took the most common route of adding supers. It's too bad they couldn't have made one of the supers some franchise staying power after the 2000s, but you know, whatever, I'm only a little bit. Supers might have been because of Street Fighter, maybe because of Tony Hawk, which is getting skipped over in this video because I've already talked about it for an hour. Point is, the focus was always on what was new what exists in this game that can't exist in others while remaining sportball. But what I think is an underappreciated aspect that makes a lot of these games work as games is what they remove. For as much as seeing Donkey Kong top a shy guy is cathartic in a way, it wouldn't matter if the rules that normally give soccer this stop-start pace that's stupid to me as a guy that's holding a controller was still in play. That's a part of what lets FIFA Street maintain this energy and value outside of just nostalgia. No throw-ins, no offside, and most importantly, no VAR or ref! It lets the pace of the match be all in all the time, and creates a flow that's more suitable to me as a player holding a controller, making for a game that I'm hyped to get stuck into, instead of a game that... Uh, from yeah. here, the new systems get a chance to shine. And that's cool, a big thumbs up, absolutely livid that they got rid of the ball speed up and charged, but you know, what's one more straw to the camel's back? Ultimately though, I think that the removal of rules that you often see shows that the appeal of most sports fantasy games is a little more fundamental than the bells and whistles. Like, Charged is great, but once the stages start to get a bit more hectic, I'm quick to call for a substitution. What's appealing here isn't just random chaos to put the narwhal bacons at midnight to shame, and different games in the genre add and retract systems unrelated to one another. So my theory on what actually makes these games cohesive and collectively scratch the same part of my ape brain is the structure of sport. Alright, this isn't gonna make sense for a bit, but, like, stick with me here. Think about an FPS, or a fighting game, at its most fundamental core. You have the player, another player, and the goal is to get rid of either one of each other. In that, there are five parts of play. The avatar, the medium, the method, the obstacle, and the goal. In games that have been designed from the construct of combat, most of the time these elements exist as a portion of either side of play. You exist as the avatar, which exists with the method, being guns to attacks or life points or whatever, to interact with the medium. In this case, eliminating what is the other that exists in both a state of obstacle and goal. This is inverted on either side, which is a part of what makes games around the prospect of elimination interesting, the conflict that comes from the same goal and how they directly impact one another. The conflict is key here, and what the sports fantasy does that's interesting is that they create a new construct of conflict. Instead of having the medium and the goal be connected to the avatars, they're removed from the player and put in a position of neutrality. The ball does not exist as an object of either side, and so the conflict is directed around the control of the medium, which can change at any time. This creates a very fundamentally different kind of conflict where you're fighting to impart properties onto an object, but that object being neutral means there are no truly positive properties. To help me illustrate what I'm getting at, 
Welcome to Lethal League Blaze. Lethal League is a game that I'm going to call a sports fantasy because I want it in the thumbnail, but also because it has a neutral medium that both players impart properties of direction and speed onto. The goal is simply to hit your opponent with the ball at enough speed to KO them. You could argue this is a fighting game for that reason. Intellectuals looking to have that discussion, please head to the nearest electric chair. While both players are likely to seek to speed the ball up, someone who has been imparting speed on the ball can quit find they regret picking up the pace as much as they have if it's stolen from them. Now the quality that they deemed positive is being used against them because the property is fundamentally neutral, and in that neutrality another player might simply let them put speed on the ball because they plan to use it against them later. This makes Lethal League especially this really interesting game of both controlling the ball and knowing how to get the position and properties you're looking for, while also trying to figure out what your opponent is looking for and how they might try to turn those properties against you. Here that's felt literally, but in other sports fantasy that same feeling runs through, just presented in new ways. Oftentimes it's positioning that felt like your opponent was closing in, turning into the opponent opening themselves up, and other times it's what felt like a lucky save turning into an unlucky own goal. The neutrality creates this elaborate extension to the tug of war conflict, and while some games are better at capitalizing on it than others, that to me is the connective tissue that I think made me enjoy all of these games that are ultimately very different from one another. And I don't know if you caught on, that's the joy of sport. Not all sports, expression sports obviously have the ape scratching at different areas, but ball sports, ball games, are all connected by the central appeal where neutrality creates conflict, which creates interaction, direct, or otherwise. That was the game design gems that each of these games kept bringing to the table, and how those games go about bringing out that neutrality determines how they shine. And FIFA and other true sports games keep bringing shards of Smash Budweiser they found on the ground to the table. Let me go their shins. The ones I find are the least glamorous tend to be the ones that aren't confident in their core design, so they lean too hard on the gamer set dressing. I'm specifically thinking about Omega Strikers, which was a game I was really excited for, but it relies too much on the MOBA angle. All the different characters with abilities and cooldowns, and there's an XP system? There's just a lot of fluff. It places way too much emphasis on the avatar, moving the focus away from the neutrality of the puck and how you interact with it towards a more conventional combat environment. The neutral space feels like an afterthought. Also, every time I look at it, I feel like I'm in an environment for tweens who aspire to be VTubers, and as someone who's old enough to be on the other side of the Stranger Danger rule, I just, I can't comfortably be here. Mario Strikers Charge did this right. There's still a decent amount of avatar variety, but the glowing ball speed up mechanic meant that all the focus was put on the ball. And when you stole it back from the opponent, whether you cleared the charge or not, you were actually interacting with the team through the neutral object. This game is goaded, very shiny. The Holy Grail though, is unsurprisingly Rocket League. It's so good, moving the car feels so good. The fact that nobody can hold possession of the ball just keeps the ball truly neutral at all time. The skill floor is below sea level and the skill ceiling is just, I'm never gonna hit that. I'm sure you knew that though. It's one of the most popular games on Steam, a marketplace you can't even buy it from anymore for a good reason. And while I can sit here and try to explain to you why you should care about the design values and your own personal journey with a car or Mario or a Ronaldo, I, I think he's on screen, I don't know football. All these qualities aren't fully expressible through words in a YouTube video. You should experience it for yourself. I get it, it's not like Street Fighter 6, you can't install a big titty mod for your car, but these games that probably don't seem like they're up your alley are diamonds in the rough waiting to be found and rekindle your love for video games. Put down your Venom for a second with your KSHS ball setup that- Oh wait, this is actually still fun, I don't want to put this down. Put it down and try some of these games. Got it? Alright, good hustle. Here's a recommendation list, I'll see you all in a month. Also Patreon.